right, I want to welcome everybody to our June 9th St. Louis Park School Board meeting. I want to welcome everybody. It is June 9th, it is Monday. Tomorrow is the high school commencement. We are excited. I hope you are. And kind of as a prelude to that celebratory event, we have a room full of students and parents who have done great things recently, and we're going to start out our meeting with spotlights. And so the first spotlight is going to be for the synchronized swimming team that came in third place. And I'm going to call on their coach, Linda Gust. All right, I, I know I'm supposed to use the microphone, so if I'm too loud, because I have a pool voice, I usually just yell a lot. All right, um, well, congratulations. Um, we uh, were second place in our conference. Our varsity record was eight and two. Um, next year we'll be joining a new conference and we're hoping for even better placing maybe then. Um, we were central section champions for the 19th consecutive year. Since there have been sections, we have been the only first place winner. Um, we advanced 21 of our 24 routines to the state meet, which obviously helped us um, attain that third place finish at state. Um, of the routines that we took to the state meet, 17 out of the 21 actually placed in the top seven. So congratulations, girls, and awesome season. And just on a, a, another piece of this is um, this year we actually had more first places than we have in the past. So congratulations uh, to Rose, Claire and Emma, and Rose and Hannah on their first place finishes in their events. So. And unless you have other questions, I think I'm ready to do the certificates or, you know, and I Yeah, can, if, you, if you call them out, I'll come I up will, and shake their hands I will and then we will happy give you your to certificates do that. Um, later. How is that? All right. So, um, and hopefully I will, will not miss any of my, I, don't, I have no, okay. So, um, these should be the swimmers that um, actually participated at the meet. So, when I call your name, come on up and stand here behind me and then we're going to introduce your parents also. So C Claire Benneke, Emma Briak, Danny Campos, Jean Karsten. I see I should talk slower. Uh, Caitlin Cole, Alyssa Crump, Brooklyn Donaldson, Rose Evenson, Nitsana Flores, Aubrey Frank, Jenna Frank, Emma Gruyer, Carolyn Goodall, Grace Hayden, Sophia Hoika, Savannah Cager, Maya Liss, Hannah Donaldson, or Hannah McDonald, sorry, Gabby Miller, Alex Munson, Haley Morgan, Julia Nathan, Claire Olson, Zoe Peterson, Cecilia Schmelzel, Sam St. Clair, Claire Steffenhagen, Melanie Steiner, Carla Tapia, Ariana Thomas, and Mimi Wyland. Oh, this is our best turnout ever. I just want to tell you, I'm so excited.
Okay, now, I know I have some parents here, too, so we would also, as we talked about at, the, at our banquet, you know, we really are a team. This includes the coaches, the swimmers, and the parents, so parents of these fantastic athletes, if you would stand so we could give you a round of applause also. Just kind of make a few rows, take some knees, do whatever we need to do. Let's get a picture. All right, can, oh, scrunch on over because they, they're going to have a hard time getting you Gotta all get in. Past the podium here. Yep. You can make another row. You know, yep. There you there. go. And next, we want to recognize our Ro Rose, Rose Reese 2014 winner. And I'm going to ask uh, Rob Metz to come speak to that. And Anna Peter, if you are here, can you meet me at the podium? Uh, this year, our recipient of the Rosary's Peace Award is Anna Peter, and I want to say a couple of things about the award itself. Every year, the schools in the West Metro meet for a banquet uh, at Temple Israel in Minneapolis, and the purpose is to honor uh, one student from each high school, and there are about 25 high schools that are represented, who are making a difference in the world. And really, even broader than that, they are really committed to using their entire life to make the world a better place. And each of these students gets up one at a time and um, gets a chance to talk about their cause and, and how uh, they are devoted to making the world better. And I can tell you, when you leave there, you are feeling like the world is in good hands. It's going to be OK, because these are amazing kids. And um, this year, our recipient was Anna Peter. You'll see her name on a plaque that hangs in the high school office. We've now been doing this enough years where we have two plaques, started our second plaque. And it's fun for me to actually go back and see five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, who these winners were and the things that they're doing. So it's a great banquet. Um, and we really want to thank uh, Temple Israel for sponsoring it every year and thank Anna Peter for this year. So thank, thank you, Anna. And next I'm going to call on Andy Ewald, who is our athletic director, and he is going to talk about several um, honors related to uh, the, the uh, Athena Award, the Boy State Track participants, and then the 2013-2014 Academic All-Conference honors. And he may explain more, but, but to get that award, you have to have a good GPA for all four years of your time at our high school, so that's really high praise. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with our 2013-14 Athena Award winner. The Athena Award goes to the most outstanding female athlete in each school. Uh, there's a banquet the beginning of May that uh, there's probably 50 schools on this side of the river. They have their Athena Award winner at the banquet down at the Minneapolis Convention Center and superintendents and principals and coaches and athletic directors and families are all there. This year our recipient is Molly Arnson. Mo
Molly's been a three-sport athlete at St. Louis Park. In the fall, she plays tennis. In the winter, she plays hockey. And in the spring, she plays lacrosse. So she's pretty well-rounded that way. She's also been a captain of all three sports. So that shows her leadership. And it transcends not just one sport, but to all three. Uh, she's also a member of the National Honor Society. And she's been an AP scholar with distinction. Um, and in the fall, she'll be going to the Ohio State University. So she is, she is a great representative of our school, of what we kind of strive to have young people that are doing multiple you know, activities, doing well academically, and then showing the leadership part, part of things as well. So I'd like to congratulate Molly on being our Athena Award winner. Yes, yeah. And if, if Molly's parents would stand up, and just so we can recognize them as well. Um, next, we're going to recognize two of our male track athletes, and for that, I'm going to ask Stan McClure, our head boys track coach, to come up, and he can talk about these two, and then we can give them their certificates as well. So, Stan. Hi, I'm Coach Stan for, uh, from the track and field team, and I'd like to recognize uh, Chris Compton. Why don't you come up, please? He's our discus thrower and shot put thrower. And I'd also like to invite Trenton Stafford up here, 10th grader, a long jumper and sprinter. Uh, I'll start with Chris. Chris was our captain this year, and he was a great help. This is my first year as head coach of the St. Louis Park team. And uh, he was a great help in getting the team together, warming them up, and uh, just making sure everything was running smoothly with the athletes directly as I work off, um, I'll call off campus here. So um, uh, Chris, he threw the disc uh, this year. He started out around 150 feet, he was throwing it, and increased it out to 159 feet, 10. He won our conference, he won our true team meet, and he, uh, he qualified for state and took ninth place in state this year. So, and, and Chris, uh, Chris will be heading to Northwestern this year in St. Paul for college. And then with Trenton, uh, Trenton's a younger guy, 10th grader, and I, I had to call upon him to uh, jump in the sprints for us. And I uh, had him run the 100 meters and uh, 200 meters this year. And he, he started off 11.8 uh, and then dropped down to 11.4, which was our fastest time this year for out of our sprinters. And it was a little unexpected but um, he has it in him. I think he can go sub-11 next year with his talent. Also, he jumped 22 feet this year to qualify for the uh, state meet, and uh, he took uh, 11th or 12th place this year and in, in a long time at state. So, I want to say uh, they, they did an excellent job this year. Also, I want to recognize uh, two others in the audience, uh, Thomas Jerf running on their uh, four by eight relay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a senior, he's also, uh, he really helped us out. He jumped in, he jumped in and uh, their team went eight, uh, eight minutes, four seconds in our four by eight relay this year, which was, uh, they dropped down uh, just within two meets, they went from uh, 810. 822 is 820. what we ran the first time. Yeah, 822, <laughs> all the way down to 8.04. So it was an amazing drop in time. And uh, I'd like to recognize our academic all-conference uh, recipient, Jacob Pokorny. Uh, Jacob ran, uh, he was part of our distance team this year and, and ran very well. 
And I'd like to just congratulate everyone here today. And uh, I look forward to next year. I, I think we're really turning things around. And uh, other coaches are taking notice also. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, also, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stafford back here. All right. And, uh, oh, okay. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our academic all-conference recipients from this past year. Um, the conference that we're currently in that will not be in moving into the fall is the North Suburban Conference. And in the North Suburban Conference, we recognize our senior scholars that have senior scholar athletes that have a 3.5 cumulative GPA or higher. So those are the kids we're going to go through here, and we have quite a few of them, which, again, is an absolute wonderful thing. Josh Anderson. Okay. Hashim Adid. Ellen Edelman. Mariah Zeman. Maggie Yarosh. Jessica Yarger. Holly Westwood, Emma Weisner, Luke Von Eschen, Kelsey Tatarek, Katrina Solzi. Isaac Stone, Margaret Stevenson, Claire Steffenhagen, Nicholas Sokolowski, Blake Smith, Ali Simonette. Are you Blake? Sweet. Job well done. Good job. Victor Victor Ruiz Shimada. Jacob McCorney, Mary Pavia, Alexander Palmatier, Nathan Orton, Claire Olson. Kimberly North, Lauren Myra, 
Lauren McManus, <laughs> Hannah McDonald, <laughs> Hannah McCracken, <laughs> Sophie Macklem Johnson. Maya Liss, <laughs> Kayla Lewis, <laughs> Samuel Larson. Dana Kunze, <laughs> Joseph Kramer, <laughs> Sue Kohler, <laughs> Graham Kellogg, <laughs> Sarah Jenison. Alexandra Howard, <laughs> Janet Holmes, <laughs> Charles Hills, <laughs> Clara Hermes, <laughs> Anders Haroldson, Isaac Greenwood, <laughs> Carter Green, <laughs> Leon Gordon, <laughs> Isabel Gonzalez, <laughs> Sarah Garcia, <laughs> Shoshana Freund, Jenna Frank, <laughs> Noah Fortmeyer, <laughs> Daniel Folt, Rose Evenson, <laughs> Michaela Ebert, <laughs> Tom Sturf. Paulsang Damdol, <laughs> Artis Cariscus, <laughs> Ben Coleman, <laughs> Samuel Casey, <laughs> Maria Brandell. Abigail Bordewick, Evan Beachenho, Noah Betts Richmond, Jenna Benkin, Maria Barr.
Cole Basig. Jeff Babcock and Molly Arnson. So parents of these wonderful young people stand up please. You going panoramic on us? Come on, Cindy. Get the camera on. Just go. And parents, feel free to come up to get your photo. I have to say, while we're getting positioned, this is one of the great things about the right size of St. Louis Park. You can participate in extracurricular activities and knock the ball out of the park with, with your academic work. And these students are one of our great examples of that. You're welcome. Well Thank you. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I know I was in Milwaukee. Cole had basketball then. It's a good way to end things. Bye. Thank you guys. Yep. Do you have more? No. Oh no, these are the leftovers. But Nancy wanted to ask me something. Nancy wanted to ask me something. So, Andy, I asked you to stay for just a minute, even though we have a full agenda. Since you're here, <laughs> you got pushed, yeah, we uh, yeah, Carrie. If you could just give us a paragraph or two about the new conference, I think that would, uh, and then we'll let you go. Sounds good. So, starting, hi, Les. So, starting the fall of 2014, we'll be in a new conference. It's newly formed Metro West. We are one of the founding members of the Metro West. Um, it started off being seven public schools kind of in the West Metro. Us, Robbinsdale Cooper, um, Kennedy, Jefferson, Richfield, Chaska, and Chanhassen. Um, the State High School League placed Benilde with us. We fought it as much as we could fight it, and they are still with us. So we've moved on and are doing a good job of working with them like we have the last handful of years in the North Suburban Conference. It's a good group of schools. It's going to, I think, revitalize some old relationships and rivalries, whether it's with Richfield, whether it's with the Bloomington schools. Um, for a year's worth of, year plus worth of planning meetings, the other athletic directors have all been really open-minded and not set in their ways about, well, this is how we've done it in our old conference. It's been really refreshing kind of starting with a blank slate and say, what has been the best? Because we're you've got schools coming from four different conferences. So what's been best practice in those conferences? And let's try to replicate that and give our kids and our communities the best possible experiences they can have. And when does that start, Andy? It starts this fall. 
Okay, this fall. Yep. I just wanted to say that um, it, I think it's great and that it gives us an opportunity to be successful in the sporting arena. Yep. More successful than we were. And uh, I think it's a great move that you guys made. Well, the, the thing is, and without kind of dragging this on too long, when we left the Classic Lake to go to the North Suburban, at that time, I think we collectively looked at that as a chance to get our feet underneath us, to really get our programs to kind of grow and become stabilized after, you know, beating our head against the wall, you know, with just the mega schools and the fact that they have so many students and just the facilities and the arms race and just philosophically where they were at. The fact that the current conference or the conference we're leaving lasted nine years for us, um, it was a good thing. It's, it did stabilize our programs, and I think we kind of always knew, you know, whether it was going to be six years or whether it was going to be nine years, that it was a stepping stone to whatever's next. And, again, having whatever whatever's next being something where it's rekindling some old late conference rivals, um, it's going to be a good thing for this community and for our kids. And I think the commute's a little less overall, which is going to be yep. good for our student athletes. Yep. So thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Appreciate thank it. you. So we'll move on. Um, we'll do the official call to order, even though we've been going for a while. And the agenda tonight is the superintendent's report. We have um, a lot on our study se session topics. We had a lot um, to get on this agenda um, because people were not available at our next meeting. And so we'll, we'll just we'll get her done. And, and that includes the district construction update and bid award report, the Peter Hobart Elementary School Annual Report, the Middle School Annual Report, the uh, ATPPS QCOMP plan change discussion, the fiscal year 2015 preliminary budget update, the health and safety annual report to MDE. We have two policies, the uh, second reading of policy 419, tobacco free environment, and then 807, the health and safety policy that is uh, being listed as a first and second reading. In fact, the policy has no changes proposed, so it's in essence a readoption of the policy that we have had. Um, we have a consent agenda, and on the action items, we have the approval of the health and safety report, contract appro approval of PC land employee group, approval of policy 419 and 807, approval of employment contract, director of technical assistance I-3 validation grant, approval of employment contract, director of I-3 validation grant, approval of a construction bid award, city of St. Louis Park telecommunications committee reappointment. We will then be to our communications and transmittals, followed by adjournment. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Same. Moved by Bruce. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries 7 0. First up, we have the district, whoop, we have the superintendent's report. I won't skip you this time, Bob. Thank you, Chair Gores. And I want to take a, a moment today to talk about an award that the high school received last week really a reflection on the entire school district, not just the high school. But it was a pretty significant award. It's the ACT, College and Career Transitions Award. And what this is, is the ACT, the people that give the ACT, ACT test all across the nation, have uh, started to recognize high schools that have done an exceptional job preparing, trans preparing their students for the transition to college and career. And St. Louis Park High School was selected about uh, four weeks ago as the Minnesota recipient of the ACT College Award. We were up against some tough competition, uh, some of the best schools in Minnesota, including Edina and Minneapolis Southwest, uh, Moundsview, Orono, and on and on. And it was quite an honor to be selected as the Minnesota ACT College and Career Transition winner. We were entered into the national competition and last week learned that St. Louis Park High School was the national winner of the ACT College and Career Transitions Award for one high school across the entire United States. So it's, it's quite a recognition and something that the entire community should be proud of. Um, there were several factors that uh, separated St. Louis Park High School from other high schools. And I'll tick off just a few of them because I think they're really important for the community to know. First of all, there's a ninth grade program at the high school that has been very successful in reducing failure rates of ninth grade students. And in a nutshell, if you pass all of your ninth grade classes, there's a very good chance you're going to graduate in four years. And the ninth grade program at the high school works very well to accomplish that goal. 
Uh, secondly, there are more college level classes taken by St. Louis Park High School students while they're in high school than almost any other high school in Minnesota. A very high percentage of students at the high school take college level classes while they're in high school. And in our case, those include advanced placement classes and international baccalaureate classes. Um, and they do very well in those classes, I might add. And there's no better predictor of future success than past success. So if you're preparing for college, there's no better preparation than taking college classes while you're in high school. Uh, another key factor was the high school has been very successful of, of, as increasing the students of color who are taking college level classes in high school. Ten years ago, there were literally a handful or two of either black or Hispanic students that were taking AP or IB classes, our college level classes. This fall, there were over 160 black and Hispanic students taking over 350 AP or IB classes and passing at a, over a 95% rate. So this takes a great deal of effort on behalf of the staff and the students, of course, and their families, and that really set us apart, I think. We also are part of programs such as College Possible that makes it possible for 40 seniors every year, most of them first in their family to ever go to college, to gain college access. And uh, over the years we've had College Possible, I believe it's seven years now, nearly 100% of the students that participate, 40 per grade, attend college. Um, I could go on and on, there's more, but for brevity I will, I will stop here and just say that I see this award as really a recognition by ACT for the high school and the whole district and the, in fact the whole community of a concerted effort to prepare students for what comes after high school. In the old days we would be satisfied with graduation and now it's changing where graduation is not enough. It's are you ready for college and career? Are you ready to enter a post-secondary school without having to take remedial classes? Are, we, are you ready to enter a career after high school or the military without having to be uh, participating in remedial classes? The bar is higher than it has ever been before. And this is not saying we've reached it by any means. We spend our whole day trying to do better. But this is a recognition that we are trying very hard and have had success and are well down the path and are really determined not to be stopped. So congratulations to the high school and the whole district in this effort. Thank you. It was really, um, it was really a very exciting honor to win that award. And I just, I, I, speaking on behalf of the whole board, we're very proud of all the efforts that have gone on over many years that are culminating in results now and are just going to continue forward. It is, it is part of our mission to have all of our students become contributing members of society. And what you do when you leave us is a part of that uh, process. And this award recognizes our getting our students ready for that next step in their lives. So it's very exciting. Um, first up, not yet Shelley, is, is the District Construction <laughs> Update and Bid Award Report. Good evening. Um, we're gonna. I'm here with uh, Paul Lapikowski from Wold Architect, and we're gonna go through the elementary addition project update as well as um, the bid award proposal, um, which will be brought before your approval um, tonight. And right now, I'm gonna go through real briefly what the addition project update is. And here's a progress since the referendum. It is a um, progress a process that um, entails a lot of different parts. Um, we've gone through various parts um, since the, um, the passing of the bond referendum. Um, we've had to go through a review and comment um, before the passing of the bond referendum to the Minnesota Department of Education, which was approved. Um, Wold has worked with um, various user groups at Susan Lindgren, Aquila, and Peter Hobart to finish the design of the projects. Um, Ellers um, solicited bids from financial institutions for the bond funding um, in January. We had district approval of the bond sale on January 27th, um, which was secured in February. 
Um, we went through some city planning commission submittals and approvals of the conditional use permits in May. Um, Wold has worked very um, hard in completing contract documents to procure the bids. Um, and bids were um, let in May of 2014 and bids were received June 3rd. Um, construction contract bids are to be awarded tonight. And as they get awarded, um, there's a lot to do going forward. Um, starting in June, um, as soon as um, tomorrow starts, I think, um, will be contractor, will be sec the contractor will be securing subcontractors, um, schedule the work and procure materials and all the other work that needs to be done. Um, they'll finalize the construction schedule. Um, there'll be pre-construction meetings with the contractor um, and detailed schedule of activities from contractor by late June. And as Paul whispered to me, it's mostly uh, behind the scenes stuff that happens before the construction actually starts happening. And then uh, going forward into July, um, we begin the work at Peter Hobart Cafeteria, um, begin demo work at Susan Lindgren office, um, and anticipation that some areas of the work will be quiet until uh, the fall, um, the additions in particular. Um, we will know more once the contractors are on board and they'll be able to get their details in place to get the contract going. Um, there's been a lot of input process um, throughout this process with Wold Architects and the principals as in other district team. Um, but ongoing, there's going to continue to be um, involvement on a regular basis through construction meetings. Um, Wold will work with the contractor um, to um, mitigate um, disruptive avoidance to the occupants um, during the school year in particular. Um, board will get the regular updates on the progress as we go. And with that, I'm going to ask Paul Aplikowski to come to the podium to uh, talk about the bid award. All right, thank you. Um, we did receive six bids from contractors last Tuesday. Um, those were um, all good bids. I think you're getting a good price, a good market price for the work that you're doing. Um, they unfortunately are not as low as we'd hoped. Um, they're a little bit um, over the budget that was anticipated um, after using the contingencies. So Sandy can talk more about that. But our recommendation is that you award those bids um, to Roshan Corporation, which was the low bidder. They have. Uh, uh, reaffirm that they're good with their bids and um, would like to move forward with the contract. Uh, also, you'll see in the bid letter, uh, we are recommending awarding the alternates. So during the course of the project, there was some additional scope that was not originally budgeted, um, primarily to do bathrooms at Peter Hobart and Aquila. Um, and again, we think that that's a fair price for the work that's anticipated. Um, it's highly anticipated. That is a scope that came out of our meetings with the site team. So we met with um, stakeholders at each of the buildings to talk that, and they identified those as some pieces they thought were critical. I was I was wondering how much over. I don't recall what the uh, original numbers were that we anticipated. Do you? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's complicated, so I'll try to make it simple. Uh, the we, we had put into the bids or into the budgets, I should say, some contingency. And to, to do this, we need to award all of that. So if we assume all that's in the budget, uh, these bids are about $190,000 over for the base bid, um, which is significant. Um, but we think as a sign of the times, um, we've tried our best to assess that with the bidders, and we don't really feel that rebidding or anything is going to get you a better price. Um, we're just seeing a lot of inflation going on with construction right now. Uh, so that's that's the overage from the base budget that we talked about before. The 144,000 for alternates is above that as well. Paul, is this the one contract that will do all the work on all four sites? Yes, we received. Um, we allowed contractors to bid in multiple ways, so they could bid on one of the projects or all of them together. Um, and as we look at the analysis of all of them, Roshan came out um, as the least expensive bid. All combined. Do you have any familiarity with them as a contractor and how well they will work with us in our educational needs since they're doing this during the school, some of this construction during the school year? 
Sure, I think um, that's something that we're going to have to work through very carefully in the pre-construction meetings and talk about. Um, we've learned a lot through Shelley, experimenting with Shelley over the last year. So we've incorporated some of those things right into the specifications to make sure we get that. But we will make that a highlight of all of the construction meetings. I think we're good. Thank you. Thanks. Well, next on our agenda is the Peter Hobart Elementary School Annual Report. We'll begin with Shelley Nielsen, who is the principal at Peter Hobart. Shelley was here several meetings back, and we had some technology issues, and then we had her rescheduled, and that didn't work. And so now we're very happy to have Shelley and her team with us today, and we're hoping the technology holds. We're hoping. Thank you for having us back. Give us just a minute to set up. So good evening. As Nancy said, my name is Shelley Nielsen. I'm the principal at Peter Hobart, and it is a pleasure to be here tonight. It was a pleasure to be here six weeks ago as well. Um, but it's nice to have the opportunity to talk with you tonight. And just to remind you that part of tonight's presentation is really almost two years. We're going to be looking back at the 12-13 school year, telling you what our goals for the 13-14 school year, and then telling you what were the initiatives that we were putting into place this school year. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to come back to you a little earlier next school year and give you some of the results for that. We're going to begin with a unique opportunity that Peter Hobart's been given this past school year. One of our families, the Crafts, are traveling around the world, visiting six continents and 14 countries. This environmentally focused trip is being shared with us through a blog that they have created, and they have created a short message for you. St. Louis Park School Board and Community. I'm Jason Kraft and I'm in first grade. I'm Jamie Kraft and I'm in third grade. We're Peter Hobart students, but this year we're traveling around the world on an environmentally focused trip. I'm Larry. It's been great to share with the Peter Hobart community and with the Wilderness Classroom, an environmental nonprofit followed by an estimated 85,000 kids. I'm Lori, and here are some of our experiences. In 1987, a classroom in Sweden started a movement to save Costa Rican rainforest. Kids in 40 countries raise money and help create the largest reserve in Costa Rica, the children's eternal rainforest. To help save endangered titi monkeys in Costa Rica, two nine-year-old girls built monkey bridges so monkeys could safely cross roads. In Drake Bay, Costa Rica, we helped protect baby sea turtles from poachers. We helped build bio gardens in the Amazon rainforest so people would have locally grown food, extra income, and less reason to cut down rainforest. We learned how some species of Galapagos giant tortoises were wiped out by invasive species and how some have been successfully preserved. We learned how warming ocean currents have bleached part of Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia. We talked about the pros and cons of feeding wild dolphins at Monkey Maya, Western Australia. We learned how Education for Nature Vietnam is trying to stop demand for rhino horn, which causes illegal poaching of rhinos in Africa. During a homestay in Cambodia, we learned how tourism is helping improve the lives of rural Cambodians. Plus, we made some great friends. In India, we saw a tiger in the wilds and learned about successes and failures of preserving their habitats. We planted trees with food and trees for Africa on the outskirts of Johannesburg. And we learned how we all need to work together to stop climate change. We're now in southern Africa. We'll spend the summer in Europe, including a trip to Svalbard, Norway, to learn firsthand how climate change is changing the Arctic. We hope you'll follow and learn with us. Bye. 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 
They also learned how to read some big words. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an exciting trip and fun to watch them grow. If you want to learn more about their trip, and it has been fantastic, there is a blog on uh, Peter Colbert's website. Going to shift to, oh, but, oh, Carrie reminded me to let you know that we raised over $2,000 for the Costa Rica rainforest. We did a collaborative fundraiser during, uh, they actually helped launch it, and then we um, executed it at Peter Hobart, and now the money is going back to them. So it's been a wonderful venture for us to have that, and as you can imagine, a lot of IB connections all year long. So now we are on to looking at our mission statement. Peter Hobart has adopted the International Baccalaureate Mission Statement for our building. We read this at every staff meeting. The mission statement guides the work we do in our district, in our building, and we believe aligns wonderfully with the district's strategic plan to close the achievement gap. I'm now gonna turn this portion of the presentation over to Carrie Runke Jones, and she will talk about our vision and reading data. Good evening. What you see here are our guiding pillars. We have four guiding pillar, pillars that we have been working toward. And these pillars determine how we allocate our time, our money, and our professional development. Now we're going to take a look at reading. Over the past three years, the students in grades three, four, and five at Peter Hobart have made adequate yearly progress in reading. These goals were either met outright or through safe harbor. Let's take a closer look at our reading. These were our building goals last year for our student, all students and our black students. As you can see, we did not meet our goals. As we look closer at the data by race, you can see that in 2011, 2012 our reading percent proficient for all for white students and black students was fairly consistent but there was a, an achievement gap in 2013 our scores did go down and the achievement gap did increase we also included though the data points for st. Louis Park and for Minnesota and you can see that our data did trend similar to St. Louis Park and Minnesota. We attribute this dip in our achievement due to the new MCA 3, where the text complexity greatly increased and what was being asked of students changed. These are our goals for this academic year. We have a goal set for all students. We have a goal set for black students. And at last year's data retreat, we also included a typical growth goal for grades two, three, four, and five. And Principal Nielsen will talk more about that in just a moment. This slide shows our tiered response for student instruction. Tier one is the instruction that all students receive. And tier, going up to tier three is instruction that is for some students, for either enrichment or for intervention. This year, I would like to highlight our self-study. Our grade level teams work collaboratively with Carrie Ross, the director of um, our curriculum director, to review our reading curriculum and instruction. Developing a common understanding of what is taught and what is assessed. There are many ways families can be involved in supporting their child as a reader. Thanks to the SLP Foundation, we received a grant for a program called We Both Read. And this was um, used in grades two, I'm sorry, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. And the books went home with students. And on one side, the pages read uh, is written at a parent level and it is read to the child to model fluency and on the other side is the child's page where the child is practicing being a reader. I'm now going to turn it over to Principal Nielsen as she talks about math. So this first graph represents the number of groups that met their AYP target that was set by the state. Peter Hobart, as you can see, in the last two years 
has made all of their targets except free and reduced lunch. This next slide shows proficiency. So this, is the, this graph represents how our students perform based on the goal that we as a district have set for ourselves. This goal only looked at students who met or exceeded on the MCA math test. Students who received partial proficiency were not included in this goal. Here you're able to see how Peter Hobart black and white students perform compared to the district and the state. Even though our scores are similar to those at the state and district level, it is obvious to us that we have a lot of work to do in order to close this achievement gap in math. So back in August 2013, we set our math goals for this school year, and you see those math goals listed right here. Once again, our goals are going to be based on proficiency, so it's gonna be meet or exceeds, it will not be on partials on the MCA, both math and reading test. You will also notice, hopefully, that we are aggressively working to close this achievement gap. Last year, there was a 30% performance gap between our black students and the school as a whole. Our goal is to reduce that gap by 12%. We have also added, as Carrie mentioned, a typical growth goal this year. And we have those in reading and in math, grades two, three, four, and five. And a main focus for us has been to look at all students' typical growth. We know that students who are behind will need to grow more than a year if we want them to reach grade level and be able to successfully pass the MCA tests. Every grade level has set a typical growth goal for their students, in color in re students of color in reading and in math. Teachers reviewed their data with me after winter benchmark assessments. We looked at individual students that were not on track for making typical growth, and we came up with some ideas and plans to help those students. It is our hope that with this focus, we'll reach our goal of closing this gap, but we'll also work to have all students reaching higher levels of proficiency. And that is part of the focus with typical growth, is you aren't just looking at one, po one pocket of population. You're really looking at every single student at Peter Hobart. As Carrie mentioned with reading, we too have spent a great deal of time in tier one with math. And the majority of our time we're focused on less whole group instruction and more small group instruction that would be differentiated to best meet the needs of the students. During staff meetings, PLC time, and meeting with me, we looked at a variety of resources to help those students who were not on track for making a year of typical growth. We've been lucky to have some instructional assistant hours to help support teachers through title dollars. The team leads and I have placed those instructional assistants into classrooms based on fall and winter assessment and performance data, looking at multiple data points. And I too would like to highlight a grant that we received from the St. Louis Park School Foundation. Peter Hobart was, was very lucky. We actually received three foundation grants this past year. Um, this one was written by Jackie Crone, a fifth grade teacher. And she wrote the grant, this math grant, to supplement the fifth grade math curriculum. The program provided manipulatives to help students grasp concepts with greater depth of understanding. We realize that some of our older students are struggling to get concepts from the concrete to the abstract. So the idea of the manipulatives is to help them have that concrete understanding before we push them into that abstract. And I'd like to show you a short video clip where Jackie Crone is leading her class using some of the hands-on equations for algebra. Okay, what do we have here? We have... Uh, 20. 20? 20. Should I write 2x's? What can I write? 2x. 2x. I can write 2x. 2x and what else? Plus 2. Okay. So that's a shortcut version, isn't it? To write it like that. So I don't have to put 10 and 10. And we need 2x. So I already have that there. And 2. All right. I would really appreciate it if you would draw it out too. Because when you get to the test, all right, when you get to the test, you're not going to have these things in front of you. So you're going to want to have these tools 
to use. Okay? What do we do first? Rahawa. Yeah, we can take two from 20. I like the way you said that. We can take two from 20, or we can say 20 minus. So before I turn it over to Kelsey, I want to tell you that we, re we rewrote this grant. Um, at winter, we were looking at our results and we're really excited about some of the growth that we've seen with our students in just the fall winter. Um, we were awarded another grant, so we are going to be broadening the horizon for how many students will have access to the manipulatives, and we will be using that with second, third, fourth, and fifth grade next year. So be excited to share end of the year results with you on that. Kelsey's going to talk a little bit about discipline data. I'm Kelsey Ogie, first grade teacher at Peter Hobart and lead bill this year. So looking at our discipline data, we have had a significant drop from 2011 in overall discipline reports. Our main focus now is getting it to be more equal in our representation of race at our school. Um, we've really been working as a team. Carrie Olafson, our elementary counselor, works closely with Shelly to monitor our students who are not being successful in the classroom because as we all know, more time in the classroom is more learning. Carrie's on our specialist PLC, and this year the specialists look at the discipline data by student every month. The students with the highest number of referrals become their target group for intervention. As an example, there were eight students who made up a large portion of referrals after and in February and March. Each specialist took one to two students to check in with at least once every day. And then looking in the classroom, in our PLCs, we looked at the discipline data and we planned strategies to help get the numbers down. In our first grade, PLC, we work on getting to know each of the students so that um, who make more frequent visits to the solution room who are not in our own class so they can have more positive connections with the adults in the building. We also talk about strategies that we are using that are working to help keep students in the classroom and following the responsive classrooms model. And next to talk about our PLCs where we have been doing a lot of discipline discussion this year as well as academic. At Peter Hobart, our PLCs are facilitated by a member of the Professional Development Committee, which consists of our bill team and a few additional members to help bring representation from all grades and specialties. Our grade level PLCs meet once a week, and specialists and special ed meet once per month because of difficulty in scheduling. Our PLCs follow the structure that you see on the board. For an example, in our first grade PLC recently, we were looking at reading data. We looked at our spring conference data in which students were not meeting the benchmark for DRA score to be at grade level by the end of the year, the purple box at the top. We then picked the students that were not at benchmark and offered them small group tutoring after school as well as small group instruction in the classroom. So looking at the yellow box, how could we approach it if the students weren't on track? Students who were already at benchmark did not need any additional interventions. So we decided to go on with their Tier 1 instruction, which includes time to meet with them in guided reading groups. Through our PLCs, we are trying to be conscious of our data, aware of students struggling, and work together to get everyone at and above grade level. So last year at Peter Hobart, we had our IB evaluation. And this, over the next five years, our job is to take their recommendations and put those into action. And so one of the recommendations was to in, sorry, improve our planners. And so we have been really working hard in providing teachers time for collaborative work so that they can reflect on what they've taught and to try to make our planners more transdisciplinary. Meaning, so as we're studying, perhaps sharing the planet, we know that we're also including reading, writing, science, and social studies benchmarks. Our exhibition is done, and it was on May 30th, we presented to the entire school, and then on June 2nd, we had our evening presentation. And it was a fabulous turnout, and it was very moving. We were very proud of our fifth graders, and we know that they are going to be ready for the MYP program. So we're going to end with just some images of our Peter Hobart community.
So a number of those slides you saw are buddies. We have classroom buddies, an older child with a younger child classroom. Kelsey's class was in there. They made hats, right, this year with her older class buddy. Any questions that you might have for us? Yes, I have a couple. OK. Um, I was wondering, uh, did you have goals that you've established yet for 24 or 14? For 14, 15? Mm -hmm. Those we will establish at the August, this coming up August, okay. data retreat. Okay. So we hopefully will, well, we'll hit, we have preliminary information on math, and then hopefully we'll have reading, and then we'll, go, we'll set it from there. And we will set a typical growth goal. So that was a Peter Hobart initiative that we did alone, and we will keep that going. A typical growth goal. Typical like growth a, goal. So that's looking different. It's not looking at MCA data. It is looking at NWA data, your MAP data, where a child comes in in the fall and where they end in the spring. Okay. And then roll that into a number. Mm -hmm. Looking Beautiful. at percentages of kids that not only do we want to get every student achieving a typical growth a full year, but our students who are behind, we need to, we need to be a year and a half to up to two years in order to catch them up. Okay. So a SMART goal. Good. It's a smart goal, yeah. Um, the other question I was wondering about the um, the parent reading, you read, I read, mm. family read, yes. Um, so, so, so you you would send a book home, an uh, adult reading on one side, and then the child reading on the other. Um, did you do anything for the non English as a first language? Thank you for asking that. Actually, the book is also we have them in Spanish. So we purchased books in Spanish. So a child who is a native Spanish speaker would take a book home in Spanish, and then there's a companion book in English. So they're growing in their home language or their mother tongue and in their um, second language. The book is leveled at the child's reading ability, and obviously the adult side is written for an adult. And there, the story coincides, they go together. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the uh, construction at your school and how well or not well that went and the new space that you have and then going forward the additional space and any lessons learned or how uh, you're going to configure things based on what you saw this past year. Right. Um, yeah, I think in hindsight you would always do something different. You just don't know until you experience it. But I'm going to tell you I love our space love it um, but if I could turn back time and I know now today what what was going to happen and how noisy and loud that that would be I think I would have adjusted classrooms I would have put cl uh, classrooms in different locations it was hard and I, I won't kid you on that so I think I have shared my stories with the other principals and I think we have spent a lot of time with Mr. Metz and we have talked with Wold Architects and have really looked at our spaces um, strategically to really feel like where we need to put where we need to put specialists where we need to put grade levels in order to minimize the amount of disruption and at times that might mean putting people on carts um, which sometimes you, you hate to hear that but if you if you know that in advance and you can plan sometimes that's the best way to instruct versus moving from classroom to classroom there were days that a teacher literally just moved to four different classrooms all day long when a class went out for their specials for an hour, then, then that class went in. And I know for us, we are going to avoid that happening. So we've set up a plan that will look a little bit different in order to make it work for us. And I know that all the principals are looking at that, that same objective. I think, you know, I'm, I'm anxious for our cafeteria. And obviously, when we get a chance to talk with uh, the new architects and Wold, or the architects with Wold and the new builder now, I'll be wanting to talk a little bit about what will that project look like when it's not finished. So our students will have lunch on that first day, which, which we know we will. It's just a matter of logistically figuring that, that piece out. So I envision at this point, Joe, that we'll have two schedules next year. A schedule that we'll start with that will look a lot like this year, but teachers in different places in order to uh, minimize disruption. And then as soon as all of the building is complete, we'll go to a new schedule, and that will allow us to really maximize the cafeteria. So shorten those lunches.
Kelly, I'm really excited about your typical growth goal. I really think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I trust that when you come back next year, you'll be reporting on that as well. Because I, I will think be. That's, you know, that's, that's one of the keys to moving the ball forward for everybody. And it'll be exciting to see how you pilot that at Peter Hobart and, um, and perhaps beyond that. Um, so I know you're going to come back and talk about next year, next, this current year, next year. But right. briefly, how was the year? I thought it was a fantastic year. I, you know, we received a lot of support this year. And to the board, I really thank you for that. I mean, it was, um, it was a tough fall coming back. I mean, we were reuniting and, and trying to um, navigate our way through grief and still coming together. But as the months progressed, um, we're a really strong community. I have said that from the get-go. Um, it's, a, it's a community that of parents and families and staff and students that truly, truly care about each other. Um, and we were there for each other. So I, um, and we were given support when needed. So if, if I spoke up and I asked, I didn't have any, um, any hard, there, was, there wasn't a, a challenge that um, Rob wasn't willing to say that let's, let's face that, let's try to help you out in that way. And so I appreciate that, that, that really truly helped us this past year. But I think we're, we're in really good shape right now, and we're feeling really good about the things that we've accomplished as a school. And I think one of the things that's healthy when you look at our building going through what we experienced a year ago is we're moving forward, which is really important. Loss is hard, and sometimes it's hard to get, not to get stuck and not move forward. But I think I'm standing in front of you today saying we're moving forward. We have aggressive goals. We had those from the get-go. And that helped all of us with a sense of normalcy to show up every single day knowing that we have an objective. We have children in front of us. We want every child to achieve at least one year of growth. And everything else for all those kids that are behind is just a bonus. So um, I'm really, really pleased. And, and our, our parent community is, it's incredible. Shelly, I had the sense of that. Um, I think we all have when we've been at Peter Hobart that, that you really have uh, a close, supportive community that is doing great for kids and we are blessed to have all all of you there but you in particular I want to thank for all Thanks. your all your leadership that you've shown through all of this thank you thank you thank you I'm not an island I tell my staff that all the time and I, that is the truth I am only as good as the people that I surround myself with so I'm surrounded by a great community it includes all of you and it includes a wonderful um, home at Peter Hobart for me so thank you thanks for allowing us to come tonight Glad you claimed, glad the technology worked, <coughs> and uh, hope you guys get recharged this summer. Thank you. Next, we're gonna, we're gonna change age grade. And you will report. It's been a while since I've been here. I don't know what all the picture is. Are you doing selfies or what's going on here? We had a, we had a room full of students at the start and they were, we were taking student picture groups honoring them for all their achievements. So. I did see that. You yeah. had a cast of thousands and a lot of faces, smiling faces were coming out the door when we came in. Well, good evening. It is a pleasure for the middle school staff to follow Shelley Nielsen and her staff with our State of the School Address. Tonight, we are going to highlight our 12-13 MCA results in math and reading, as well as the work planned and completed in the 2013-14 school year, one we're finishing in three days, to improve student learning. Presenting with me this evening to my right is Mia Waldera. She'll be presenting the reading goals and information, and she is also our IB coordinator and our sixth grade writing teacher. To her right, to her right is Jason Bowl, who is our assistant principal. What makes Jason unique is he did his student teaching in our school. He was hired as a math teacher in our school. He did his internship with me, and he was the dean of students with me, and now is the assistant principal. So he, he has progressed really the channels to, to being second in command in our school. Supporting us this evening are three people in the back row that only three of four people in this room who are sitting in the crowd. In the crowd. In the crowd. You're three. You're the fourth. Shelly's just here. So. 
please don't take your toys and go home, Shelly. So Lil Zumberg on the left, give a little wave. There is our language and literature teacher. Alongside of her is Gina Magnuson, our Dean of Students. And they're really sitting here as our co-RTI coordinators and our PD coordinators in our school. To their, to their left, uh, your right, is Derek Winterberg, our athletic director. Yes, nice wave. Uh, department chair, PE teacher, and ATPPS coordinator, along with being our developmental designs coordinator. He has a lot of titles. This evening, I'm going to remind us that we're talking about strategic objective one. And I really don't have to say this to the board members, but I'm gonna read it tonight for the public. All students will achieve the knowledge, skills, passion, and attitudes to meet or exceed rigorous academic standards without demographically predictable result, results in order to succeed in their future. It's our goal. You made that goal. It's an excellent one for our district. We do have a vision statement in our school, and I say it every time I'm here. Create a safe and caring learning environment, ignite students with individual, engage students with rigor and relevance, ignite individual growth. I always start out the presentation which really talks about, we're talking about reading and math this evening, is really talking about some foundational pieces that we, we check on every year in regard to questions we ask students, questions we ask staff, and questions, we just added two new questions for parents on how well we communicate with them. You will notice that 90 plus percent of our students responded by saying strongly agree or agree that they feel cared for in our school, that adults in our school treat them with respect, and that adults in this school really want them to do well academically. And that foundation is a great place to start with our students. In regard to our staff, you can see that they talk almost at a 90% level. They love their peers and their colleagues and they feel supported by them at school. They're satisfied with their relationships. The students of different races work well together at my school. That's always historically high. 96%, I think it's the highest we've ever received from our students. Regarding our communication survey, these are two results that I've never brought to you before. First, OT News Red Weekly, which is our electronic newsletter, is reported at a readership rate of 97%, and it's free, no postage. It, it comes every Friday, and 97% of our parents respond, who responded to this survey, that they read it. Our middle school website, used weekly and monthly by our parents, is almost at a 73% clip. We like seeing those results reaching out to parents. At this time, I'd like to turn over to Mia Waldera, the podium, who will be sharing our reading results and information. Mia, yeah, it's all yours. Good evening, Superintendent Metz, board, our community. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, as we take a look at our reading goals for the 2012-13 school year, we set these in collaboration with our district assessment director, Prachi Mukherjee. So as you take a look at those, know that we worked in tandem with her. And if you notice also, we set our goals based on the percent proficient in the areas of meets and exceeds on the state MCA tests. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in future slides. This slide highlights our reading goals for the 2012-13 school year and then the results that we received. We are not pleased. We did not receive our, reach our goal, and we have not closed the achievement gap in our school. But when you take a look at our partially proficient students um, and some of the other factors that we'll bring out around this test, we'll see that the data does look better. Uh, and I'll show you in a few slides what we plan to do on how we're hoping to improve this, the results that you're seeing here, through the professional development and the student interventions that we've put into place and will be continuing to put into place.
This slide shows the reading goals and the results of the 12 and 2013 school year from our middle school and for the state of Minnesota. So if you look at the bars on the left, those are our 2012 results, and then the bars on the right are the 2013 results. So again, we're disappointed in our drop from 2012 to 2013. And, and maybe to help understand these results better, it's important for us to take a look at in 2013, the MCAs in reading were a new test. These were aligned with the Minnesota Language Arts Standards adopted in 2010 by the state. And in the 2012 test, the results cannot be compared with the results from 2013. It's a new test, and whenever there is a new test, the state has encouraged us to understand that there's probably going to be a dip in the results. So that's one reason when we take a look at that, we see that. In, and for another reason, we can't compare the scores because with our new standards, they're based on the common core. So it's a very different set of standards as well. Um, as you can see in our results, the state and our school had a hard time keeping up with the changes in the standards that we saw. And we have plans to intervene, and we're already doing. And our counterparts across the state also struggled with teaching to this new test. We believe we're competitive in our state. When you take a look at our results, we maintained better than the state in each category shown, even though this was a very rigorous test. So if you look at our middle school results, our drop was 12% drop for all of our students, but across the state, it was a 16% drop. And you can look in each of the categories. We maintained better in each of these categories. When we look at our AYP reading results, we're happy, very happy to report that when we're talking um, about these results and taking into consideration our students who were partially proficient, we met every AYP expectation for the state. Each category was met by the middle school. So our reading goals for the, this school year, 2013-2014, are posted here. And it's an adjustment from last year. And again, we worked in collaboration with our district director of assessment, Prachi Mukherjee, to design these. Looking through our 12-13, our 13-14 school year on the reading interventions we had in place, you'll notice we had a number of interventions. And what I'd like to do tonight is just highlight two of those for you. So first of all, in bold, you'll notice something called Read Naturally. And uh, the Read Naturally program is a reading intervention for students who are below grade level in the area of phonics and fluency. And it's a computer-based program. And we delivered this intervention during Thursday RTI time. So students were taken from an enrichment class to get an extra uh, support in the area of phonics and fluency for reading. Another intervention that's highlighted it's called enrichment classes. And what's interesting here is every Thursday, our schedule at the middle school is adjusted for an RTI schedule. And it allows for an additional tier one support every single week for our students. So for example, a language arts teacher would identify students falling behind on a skill for that week and or a concept. And then they would pull them from the enrichment class and then we would receive further instruction, different instruction, extra instruction on that skill or concept to help the student be successful every week on a weekly basis. This year, from quarters one to three, we've had 723 different students receive one or more interventions during that RTI enrichment block. And then there are some of our enrichment classes are listed there, sign language, Latin dance, and so on. And if you've had a chance to visit our school during this RTI time, you'll see it's very in, very engaging time for our students. Just a quick question. When did we start the R RTI schedule? Was that two years ago, or was this the first year, or longer than that? This is our third year. Thank you, Mr. Bull. 
uh, as we move ahead and look at our reading uh, professional development for the 13-14 school year. Again, there were a number of things that we've put into place during this school year, and I'd like to highlight two of those. So the top one is requiring staff to create student groups in power grade by MCA data and race. And then throughout the year, we had time to have st uh, staff analyze their scores based on that. So really what this is, is that MCA data is put right into the grade book by class and by students. So we can quickly track how students, for instance, all of our partially proficient students, how are they doing on a weekly basis on every assignment? It's a, it's a huge asset for us in our professional development time to be able to quickly look up our student groups. It's a, a large asset when we're looking at RTI polls. So when a teacher is pulling students on a weekly basis, they can quickly take a look. Um, it's just in time for them. It's an uh, intervention and a skill just for that week, and, and this is a great tool to help us to be effective with that. Um, and it also affects the guided daily instruction. For instance, if we want to differentiate in a classroom, we can quickly sort kids by their MCA data because this is set up in our grade books and it's been supported throughout the year. Now, the other one I'd like to highlight is the bottom one that's in bold. Um, and one of the first things that Carrie Ross did as Director of Teaching and Learning in our district was to help us gather a baseline of some of the practices we have in our reading and language arts classrooms. So the SEC, or the Survey of Enacted Curriculum, was taken by all of our language arts teachers in grades six through eight. And they took this survey, and now with the data and the information, we can see what people are actually teaching in each of their classrooms related to these new Common Core standards. And we can make adjustments. We can make adjustments on a teacher level, on a, a grade level, and as a school. And that baseline data will um, put us in a position of being much more intentional and successful in the future. And this screen highlights not just reading professional development, but our building also has another ha has many other professional development opportunities. And I'd like to highlight one of these for you. As you know, we are a candidate school for the middle years program of IB, and we're very excited to be in that position as a candidate school working toward authorization. Just wanted to remind you if you weren't aware, the middle years program went through a major revision in its program globally that just finished revising this past January. So we've been working through the candidacy level as the middle years program was revising their own program, which added a little bit to our complication of understanding things. So with that in mind, the development over 30 MYPIB unit planners was very significant for us this year. And the reason we highlight that this will have a positive impact on our results is because not only language arts staff, but all staff have put together their units in this framework. Um, the framework allows us to choose our own curriculum, but puts it in a way that really reinforces a very high level of rigor. It expects uh, and demands internal standardization and expectations not only in language arts, but across all subject areas, and in the future will demand global standardization of our expectation and student results. So we're very pleased and hopeful that this work will continue to help us raise our scores across the board. All right, I turn it over to Mr. Bull. Yes, Mia, before you go, can I ask a quick question? Or actually, it's more of a statement, I guess. Okay. Um, on the reading piece, you showed the um, graphs, it, it just strikes me as odd that um, the black students all drop by 20% versus the white students only 9%, both state and for us. So it would make me think that maybe the questions that were asked weren't really interpreted the same way or something. I'm not for sure, but that's something that would be interesting to uh, bounce off the state as you said you were going to um, have a dialogue with them or something. Thank you. Good evening again, everybody. So I'm going to be talking about the math goals, results, and interventions. Here's our goals for 2012 and 13. For math, 71% of all students will meet or exceed proficiency. 48% of black students will meet or exceed proficiency. And here are our results. 
Um, obviously, we're not happy with these results and know that we have a lot of room for growth. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about some of the things that we found out from digging a little bit deeper into these results and, and ways that we can improve. When you factor in partially proficient students, this has historically been something that we've done, or we've looked better at when we look at AYP results. Um, again, have, have a lot of room for, for growth and improvement. Um, if you look back to 20, or sorry, 2008, 2009, we had another dip that year, and the following year we made a lot of improvements. So we're hoping for a similar rebound um, next year with our, with our math results. Here are our math goals for this year. 74% of all students and 54% of black students will meet or exceed proficiency on the MCA math test. And here are some of the interventions that we did this year. Um, we, by design, put more students in our advanced math classes, making our regular math classes and grade level math classes a lot smaller in terms of class size. So if you're looking at just across all of our regular math classes, you had class sizes. Um, the largest was 27 students, and uh, the smallest was actually 11 students. And for the majority of our grade level math classes, they fell somewhere between 14 and 24 students in terms of class size to give teachers more time to work individually with kids um, and hopefully give those students a better chance um, to meet proficiency or at least partially proficiency on the MCA math test. We did a lot of math professional development this year. Um, one of the things we did in mid-February and late to late February, we took the OLPA assessment, which is really a MCA practice test for math. So all of our students took that, and the, and the results were, were instant. So our teachers had about a month and a half, two months prior to the MCA math test to work a little bit more focused with students, um, more small group instruction, and really get an idea of where we were lacking when it came to the MCA test this year. We also brought in Deb Ricken, who is a retired math teacher from Centennial High School. Um, Carrie Ross brought her in to work with our, our math teachers. And what we really found out is we, we were not being really efficient with our focus. Um, a lot of the things that we were focusing on, we sh should not have spent that much time on that subject or that standard. And the things that we should have been spending more time on, we, we were not doing. So as, as we look to the future, we, we still have a lot of time to spend in this area to make sure we are aligning our instruction and our time spent on certain things with where it should be. Um, but this, this gave us, I think, some reason as to why our results were, were kind of what they are and gave us, gave us an idea of where we need to focus on and spend more time in our PLC time, um, in our department time. Jason, I have a quick question. Thank Don't mean to throw you off base. No, no problem. Um, so if we're spending more time, I, I understand that um, when, when we took the assessment, there was time spent on things that we didn't need to spend time on. But if we're focused more on the items that will help us um, do better at the test, the standard test, mm -hmm. um, are we at risk of losing something? as in the rest of the curriculum that we're, we're not going to pay much attention on? Mm -hmm. Maybe Good question. a question to you, Karen. Well, and I guess and my, my answer would be we, if we look at the whatever grade level standards that we're talking about, whatever grade level standards we're talking about, um, we were not spending the right amount of time on those standards. So, so let's say um, if you look at algebra, algebra is one of the main focuses of seventh grade standards, we were not spending nearly enough time on that standard and spending equal time on something else that algebra clearly is, is more, you know, there could be four standards of algebra versus one in data and statistics. We were spending equal time on, on all of those. So to me, it's just, it's, if your game plan isn't, isn't strong, the results aren't gonna be there no matter how good the teaching is, no matter how hard we're working. Um, so to me, it's really, we're gonna be more effective and efficient in our in instruction and in our focus. I don't know if Carrie, if you have anything to add on that, or okay. <laughs> and in terms of other professional development that I'll be talking about, um, as Mia went into some more detail around our MYP unit planners, uh, this summer and then all of first semester, we took um, developing how are we going to score our IB summative assessments, which are very, very rich in nature, um, very holistic in nature. Um, 
now we have in place uh, a way right on PowerSchool. If you go into PowerSchool, you're going to see every course has a IB course right right next to it, and you can easily tell um, what what the what your student got in terms of an AF score on an assessment, and then what the corresponding IB assessment score is, which is usually on a zero to eight rubric. That is all in place now. So this whole year, as we're working more on IB unit planners, all the grading and assessment, it's all taken care of, and it's right there for parents and students to see right on PowerSchool. So we're really proud on how that turned out. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. So now, is that easy for our teaching staff? Is it automatic, or do they have more stuff they need to do to make that easy for me? I think, I mean, with anything, it's a learning curve. So I, it took some time to teach how, how, that, you know, how to do it. But actually, once we got through the training, I think staff found out it was, it was a lot easier than what I think they initially expected. I would kind of look at my colleagues in the background if that's true. But um, I think there was a lot of hesitation. But as you, as you kind of peel back the onion, it wasn't nearly as labor intensive as I think people thought it was. So. One of the things that you talked about, Karen, is it easier, will it, is it easier for you? The, the thing that, that maybe you're not aware of is we're tied to the high school. Power school, we just can't do whatever we want to the power school. So when you see a dash, a zero, or a hundred, part of that is the fact that if we change our system here dramatically, it'll have to shift the high school. We're married together. That's why you see some of the, I'm going to call it a little funky right now at this point in time, is because our two systems are married together. I mean, I find it very easy to click on my kids' stuff and see both, but it's got to be hard for somebody on the back end because you're making it very easy for me, and I appreciate that. We would like to move it even farther, and we intend to do so, uh, and and move away if we can from that zero and that hundred, and move really more to the the rubric and being able to put it right there. But it's a work in progress. Yes. Twenty fourteen fifteen. I am going to retire after this evening, the first statement on this slide. And I want to thank you for helping me to retire that. It's called Coordinated Middle School Program Begins. Aren't you guys pleased? Aren't you tired of me talking about this? I thought you said you were going to retire. Oh, you did? <laughs> After that meeting. I'm still just a young guy, Ken. No, I'm retiring this phrase, Coordinated Middle School. You know, it is now just who we are. That's what we're moving to this fall because you granted us the resources. You supported our programming. You supported the work that we're really we've been doing now for four years. When we started here, when we started with sixth grade, it was four years ago, and we had 913 students enrolled. This coming year, we're projected at 1,003. I think I came before you and I said, we make, we make these changes, it'll help us also grow our school. And we're seeing that happening. Because, because many things that we're putting in place, one of them being so fundamental as we shifted from starting our middle school in seventh grade to starting it in sixth grade. It's been a three, in, we will be starting a three year process of really taking our elementary teachers and making them content specialists in either language and literature, individuals and society teacher, math or science. And so we're starting that process and so the journey to being a coordinated middle school, which I won't say anymore after this evening, begins and it'll completely end when our staff become content specialists. We have developed acceleration classes uh, in both math and reading required for the coming year. And I, I notice here it's a little flipped around here. I don't know why the technology is being a little different for me here. But we've developed and implemented math and reading required acceleration classes for all students. I love the way Carrie talks about it. She talks about it as being a second scoop, a second scoop of math, a second scoop of reading for students who are multiple grade levels behind. So a question you might ask, is it just more of the same? It is not. It's foundational work that will support the class, the regular grade level class that the students will be taking. 
We're also developing some uh, new enrichment classes, some you may have heard of, digital storytelling, microbiology, digital photography, world drumming. Uh, those are just a few of the new enrichment classes our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students will be able to take, and we've gotten rid of the required study hall in 7th grade. And lastly, we will be applying for I, Bruce, thank you for clapping. We will be applying for IB authorization this coming spring with a site visit the fall of 2015. Here is an example of really a Minneapolis artist, author, and photographer, Wing Huey, that has worked with our students conducting an IB experience called Chalk Talks. It's work to expand global mindedness through having them answer, our students answer six questions about themselves. Just an example of how uh, powerful our IB uh, focus and curriculum is proving for our students. And lastly, here are some pictures of our students in action. And this concludes our presentation. I've got a couple of questions. Trying to see if the microphone's working. Um, the first short one, the parent survey, how did you collect the parent responses? We, Is that an electronic survey? Yes, or? thank you. Yes, uh, Carrie Jennison, one of our site council members, uh, developed the survey, and it was done electronically. So the question you might ask, well, you know, if you didn't have technology, how would you be able to conduct the survey? Well, fortunately, it, that question was kind of answered for us through the tech department just a month ago when they conducted an extensive survey, and I think you, you know that, that over 90% of our staff, or 90% of our parents, 94% I think it was, says that they say that they have internet access at home. So 97% of our parents who responded said they're looking at our newsletter that we're putting out, and the district put out a survey through an extensive process that said 94% of our families are actually wired. And that's part of why I asked, because I knew that we had talked in the, the P, P, um, site council more about that, and I think yep. that's important to think about when we do surveys. There's also language that we need to um, explore, too, so we can get the full response, or, or make sure that we've got the full picture of our parent perspective. Uh, my other question is on math, and at the middle school, have we looked at the impact of our level, our regu having two different kinds of math classes, the regular and the, the advanced math. Um, I know there's research out there that says if you have mixed students at mixed levels, they will all, re it doesn't slow the high flyers down and raises the other students. Um, there's also research to the contrary, and it's pretty common to have tiered math classes because we do tend to have kids at very obviously dramatically different grades. Um, and the sub question in there, have we looked at how students are placed in those level of classes so that we're making sure they're where they can be and that sure. we don't have disparities in the assignments to the, the sure. classes? Well, we're placing students new in our math classes. It's really a new process this year that's following the high school. Jason, I'm going to let you share that information because we spent about a half a year studying this to put this into place. Yep, and I, I got two things to that, Julie. The, the one would be this, this year, so when we register kids in January and February, we let all students sign up for the level of math and the level of language arts that them and their families felt that they were best prepared for. So we provided data, and then our teachers would provide coaching or questioning or you know, counseling if, if students or, and families had questions. But ultimately, the, the final decision lied with the families. So, and we kind of followed the high school's approach to honors block to hopefully try to encourage more kids. And, and if there's a time to try it, I'd say middle school is a great time to try it before GPA and credits and all those things come into play. So we did that this January and February. And with regard to the, it's a topic that gets brought up, I'd say enough that, you know, the, I think the thing that we've done is, is do, you, do you put a kid in, in a math class where their level of ability is to challenge them and hopefully get them success there? and maybe have the class size be more you know, fitting for them, smaller class size, have more support, some instructional assistance in the class? Um, or do you 
you know, just group everybody across the board in, in one class? What's the best way? And I, I, I don't, I don't know the best, the best answer. I don't know if people that are smarter than me sitting over there have a better answer or not. But we have talked about it. And my, my question really was a question. It's a concern I've heard to some extent from parents, our kids ending up in the right place. I didn't know that we had moved to put yourself where you mm -hmm. want to be, given the advice you're given. That can go both ways. I, uh, having had children who sometimes, when given the choice, thought the easier choice might have been the wiser one, um, which it isn't always. Anyways, um, so I'm glad to know that we've moved to that model because that means we're empowering families and kids to a stronger extent. And uh, I just want to make sure that we are looking at this periodically so that um, we're not, and looking at the issue of, of um, the, the, the racial demographics of our, our classes too and that we look at that each year so that we're um, attentive and adjusting where needed. Julie, we're meeting this uh, on June 24th on the alignment of our curriculum and what we're teaching at each grade level. And Carrie, help me who the person is that's helping us on June 24th to do that. Sue, Sue Weigand, is that right? Ta can you give me a little bit of background? Uh, Sue Weigand has done um, She's the state mathematics specialist. She's done some work with the middle school and the high school and our elementary teachers over the last couple of years. And she is the expert in uh, alignment practices from across the state. So she's gonna help us cut to the chase and get to work so that we can get busy with uh, working on MYP this summer. Yeah. Grouping will be one of those topics discussed as well. Great, and she's got a great reputation. She's fabulous. You know, have good assistance there. Well, good, I just wanna keep that issue um, on our plate. Thank you. Thank you. I too hope you get recharged this summer. You may not be off, but I hope you get recharged. Next up, we're gonna talk about the ATPPS QCOMP plan changes discussion. Good evening, good evening board members. I'm back up here giving you a quick update on the current ATPPS, otherwise known as QCOMP proposal, and actually have some good news. The teacher group voted on the QCOMP proposal last week and it passed. So what you're going to see has been approved by teachers and uh, I'll be bringing it back to you two weeks from today to ask for your approval as well. There are a few changes from our old system. Uh, mostly they're represented on this slide. There are now going to be three district-wide equity coaches. This current year there were two. And so this represents the addition of one more equity coach. That leaves room for approximately 52 bills. Uh, the terminology for those at home stands for building instructional leaders. These are master teachers or coaches that observe and coach uh, other teachers. There's one lead bill per building, and uh, there is a half-time position of 0.5 FTE to coordinate the entire QCOMP system. QCOMP dollars come from the state, and we get about $1.2 million per year to use for QCOMP. The idea is to use these coaches and building instructional leaders to fully develop our teachers. Uh, the second slide shows what the equity coaches will be doing. The equity coaches uh, will be coaching approximately 40 to 50 teachers each or 120 to 150 teachers across the district. Um, this is, again is an expansion of about 40 to 50 teachers from this year who are going to receive help from an equity coach. Uh, the equity coaches are full-time positions so they have time unlike the bills who are teaching full-time 
uh, to cover for a teacher so they can observe a different teacher. They're going to conduct the building bill meetings and manage all the paperwork for the teachers that they work with. You, the board knows that I'm a big supporter of equity coaching uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because the equity coaches have more time because they are full time out of the classroom. They have more time to devote to the teachers that they're coaching. They need to do three uh, coaching sessions per year, but in actuality they have time to do much more than that. So they can do three full time coaching sessions. They can stop in and watch 10 minutes of a lesson. They can come back and watch 30 minutes of a lesson. They have the ability to really uh, sit with that teacher and coach them through how to, how to change what they're doing in their classroom to close the gap in their classroom. If you were going to really capsulize it into one quick statement, I would do it this way, that the, the teacher needs to be teaching in a manner that meets the students that are sitting in front of them. And we are often uh, teaching the way we were taught. I'll speak for myself. Uh, 30-some years ago, I learned how to teach, and someone taught me how to do that, and I tried to emulate the person that taught me, and, and so I'm a teacher. I did it the way I was taught. Now, the students that are sitting in front of us are very different than they were 35 years ago, and it requires some changing, and it requires some adjusting of how we teach, and lots of different things come into play, and it's not that easy to do, and having a coach to help you through that process is really uh, what I'm excited about. We will still have uh, many bills or building instruction leaders. They will conduct observations just like the coaches do. They are teaching full time though, so their, their time is much more limited. They will come in and do three observations per year. Each teacher will have three observations per year by a bill. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that really for the first time our teachers will get a choice as to who they work with. Do they want to work with a bill or do they want to work with an equity coach? They'll get a chance to volunteer to go one way or the other as we continue to test this equity coaching model. Uh, bills will also attend building bill meetings and manage paperwork and they will receive an extra stipend because they are teaching full-time and it is not their full-time job they will receive an extra stipend for being a bill. I have a quick, quick question. So are the, the teachers who might benefit most from having an equity coach potentially going to pick a bill or are they getting, do you think they're getting the same service from from either one. Yeah, I think I think they're getting good service from either one, but different services from either one. And this year, the first time through, we're letting the teachers select. So it's really going to be up to them whether they select a bill or an equity coach. Having not done this before, I don't know how the, the selecting will go. It, um, we've decided that if not enough people select equity coaches, the bills will select equity coaches. And I think that's a great step forward. So we have a wonderful bill right here. And uh, the, the best way to, to spread this model and to continue, to continue to learn about this model is to cross-pollinate. And we're, we're planning training this summer that will be offered to both bills and equity coaches. And uh, I think it's really a good step if, if there aren't enough people willing to select an equity coach that the bills will step in and and they will be coached by equity coaches. Um, some other small changes this year is the uh, mentor program will be on hold and I don't want you to panic about that because we've used some of our QCOMP dollars in the past to uh, pay for mentors and because equity coaches are a little more expensive we are saving money by not having formal mentoring. However, Carrie Ross will tell you we met just this morning to talk about this topic and I don't want you to, to uh, worry that the teachers will be left without good supports because we're going to put something together for them but the funding won't come from QCOM. Uh, there won't be any site grants. Uh, there were in the past if there were if there were dollars left over from our QCOM budget uh, teachers and schools could apply for site grants that money will be redirected 
the paperwork will actually be reduced. And for all uh, coaches and bills, there will be a new equity component to the work that they do. So that's exciting as well. So I think this is a very good compromise. I'm appreciative of the, the teacher union for uh, promoting this and helping us get this passed. And I think going from two equity coaches to three will allow us to continue to test this model. One other thing I should say is in the past, the two current equity coaches were high school teachers, and they only coached at the high school. Under the new model, the three equity coaches will be district-wide coaches. They won't be assigned to any one school. They won't be assigned to the high school, for example, and they'll be working district-wide. And that's another, I think, good step forward to kind of spread the testing of this model. I'm assuming that about 80% of the high school teachers will select an equity coach because that's about how many voted for this proposal. But um, they, the, the, I, the concept, I would say, of having the coaches be district coaches, not, a, not assigned to a school, is also a positive step forward. So I'm willing to answer any questions about this, and, and uh, we'll be bringing it back in two weeks for your approval. So how does that, an equity coach, how does it work uh, at PSI unless they're bilingual? How can they, a teacher be adequately or effectively reviewed? That's a very good question. Thankfully, one of our coaches is a Spanish teacher, uh, Joy Espolt, and so she speaks Spanish uh, more than fluently. So we'll at least have one coach that, that will be able to do that. Um, you know, I'm not sure. We have a talented person in our audience that might be able to answer that. Well, I, th I suppose the bills at PSI cover well, each other. Well, that's why you either end up with an equity coach who is kind of then at a school. Yes. Sort of by necessity. By, by necessity. Or, um, or there is some encouragement to at least at that school have the bills. Yep. One of the things I really like about equity coaching is it's different than you would expect. Um, first thought is someone's coming in my room and they're going to tell me what to do. And that is the, exactly the opposite of what an equity coach does. They come in and they, they listen. They start by watching the students, not the teacher. And, and they sit with the teacher and they help them talk through how things are going in their classroom and where they need to grow. They look at data together, they draw some conclusions, and the whole model of coaching is really highly based on listening and coaching that teacher to help select an area of improvement that's gonna help close the gap, and then supporting them. And now you've probably heard me say before, there are, are many different reasons why that gap might exist, and for each teacher it's different. So for one teacher it might be that their relationship with the students isn't strong enough. So the coach can help the teacher identify that and coach them to have a better relationship. For another teacher, it might be that their curriculum is inappropriate. They're having the students read books that don't even apply to the students that are sitting in front of them. And they might need help developing new curriculum. For other teachers, it might be their grading system. You know, they're using a grading system that, that uh, doesn't fit with the students that are sitting in front of them. And they can change how they grade, and that can make a big impact. For another teacher, it might be their parent connection and how, are, how well they're communicating and connecting with parents and giving parents updates. So every teacher is different and every classroom is different and the equity coach has the opportunity to, to learn what's happening in that room with that teacher, with those students, and coach them. So I'm excited about it. Glad we can have another year to try it. Thanks, Rob. It's good news. Thank you. Next up is the fiscal year 2015 preliminary budget report. Sandy Salen. Well, Sandy's getting set up, I'll say. I remember times when we spent meeting after meeting after meeting working with our budget to try to get comfortable with what it's going to be. And it's kind of refreshing to be down to what we think is this meeting, and then we'll look at it and finalize it next meeting. Yes. Um, 
the board has before them a detail of the budgets, but what I'm going to provide for you tonight is a summarization of what those details mean um, as far as the fund balance goes. And looking at um, the general fund, I'm going to highlight a few items and not necessarily go through each one. But looking at the general fund, um, the top line is actually a compare. Actually, there's a comparison between what we have as the fiscal year 2014 revised um, to the 2015 proposed. And looking at the general fund for the general operations. Um, we have um, 52734960 of revenues. And if you go to the expenditure budget down below, you will see 51956156 And when you go down to the summarization, the projected fund balance is, is quite close to what we had, actually a little bit better than what we had at the, on the projection model at 5,654,890, which is showing it going up um, from the current year, which was anticipated with the additional revenue sources coming in. Yes? Just as a starting point, when you say FY14 revised, you're taking into account the January budget? That's correct. Okay. So mm -hmm. And like I said, I'm not going to go through each line item, but just to highlight some items, um, the ATPPS um, um, budget um, revenue and expenditures as, as stated. Um, we have the capital. Um, we did have revenue of $1,632,733 and um, expenditures of, of $1,779,166. Um, as we stated with our presentation regarding the projects, we did go over with our bond projects um, than what is, was anticipated on the, um, on the uh, bid award letter, and um, we are going to be using some of our operating capital to, um, to offset that additional expenditure. Um, but, there, but looking at the fund balance um, down below, um, it still is going to be um, around that $2 million range. It's going um, to 1,996,577. So there is still, and this does not include um, any of the revenues from the Elliott sale at this point, because um, we did not put that in as a budget amendment. And this, um, the budgets for fiscal year 2014 only include the budget amendments. Um, as well as for fiscal year 2014, I just want to shed some light. The projected fund balance is unaudited. So there might be some audit um, um, adjustments that might occur that brings them up or down depending on what the audit results are. But this is just estimates at this point in time. Um, looking at health and safety, just uh, wanted to shed some light on that also. That's one of those... Um, budgets that kind of makes itself up within the next few years. Um, we actually levy for it before all of the projects are actually approved at times and plus um, all of the projects um, for past may not be finished um, and so there's adjustments that come through with the levy process so it's kind of a reconciliation process that continues over a few years and eventually makes itself up where we get the adjustments in revenue but we get our revenue for all the projects that have been completed in following years. Um, so that's why you see there was some adjustments for prior years for the health and safety revenue for fiscal year 2015, bringing that revenue down to 9,255. But of course, we have um, expenditures um, that we anticipate of 335,450, bringing that negative uh, fund balance to 170,999. But that will make itself up in the future years to come where we'll get levies to cover that. Um, also, um, food service, um, I, oh, I just wanted to mention on the general fund, there is also assigned reserves that um, we did dip into a little bit. We had um, some expenditures for integration expenditures that we had assigned revenue in place for that where if there's um, expenditures that aren't allowed that we would potentially be able to use that funding source for it for the assigned reserves. So we did dip into it a little bit with the understanding that we're going to be taking a look at it in the next few years as far as how this is going to be sustainable throughout time. So therefore, our signed fund balance went down slightly. 
Um, the Food Service Fund, I'm not going to go through the uh, budgets, um, but the um, Food Service Fund, as far as the reserve goes, um, is actually increasing slightly uh, to 215446 um, Community Education Fund, the reserve is um, pretty stable, a little bit lower than what it was um, anticipated for this, this year, at, but next year it's anticipated to be at 277216 um, debt service fund, um, which is basically the fund that pays for our principal and interest payments for our bond um, payments, is um, it's pretty much stable, remaining stable at one million four hundred eighty-three thousand thirty-nine. And um, then we had to add the um, actually it was it's not called budget projects, it's called bond projects um, of four um, estimated four point two five nine when we had this, but that's probably going to go up a little bit now that we got the um, the bid award letter. But we don't have the revenue source in either yet because that was not something that we put on the budget amendments. But what we'll see for the end of the audit, we'll see that revenue source coming in, which will um, um, bring that fund balance up to where it needs to be. Um, and looking at some of the restricted reserves, um, I'm not going to go through each one, but um, there's basic skills as well as staff development. Staff development is basically the carryover. Then we're estimating it to be the same of expenditures that weren't spent from the current year that roll into the next year. Um, other than that, that's all I have for the budgets unless there's any questions. Sandy, the budget assumption in terms of enrollment is 4,938. Um, based on what we have for this year, what's the change? Well, remember, and, and this is something that we actually had conversations in the Finance Advisory Committee where there was change in legislation where the weights of each um, average daily membership actually went down. And so this year we have like 5,100 Wadhams altogether, um, but that along with the 74 um, early childhood special ed Wadhams is what we're estimating for next year. But in lieu of the decrease in the weights in the average daily membership, we're actually getting additional revenue source to offset that from the state. So how many more students are we assuming we're gonna have? Um, Gosh, I don't have that with me. I'm thinking it was um, 130 in, in that range. But I can get that to you as far as what the actual number of students are. The actual, it's somewhere in the 130 range. I just wanted just to ask that because that's, that's kind of where this all flows up or down usually if our assumptions on our students are close or it's not too conservative, then we're it's a big piece. And, and what we used in the assumptions during our finance advisory committee discussion was we used January's um, numbers because what happens during the year, they drop off. Um, so January numbers was, but yet in the beginning of the year, we had more students then. So January seemed like a good starting point to, um, to take a look at what that enrollment would be, but I believe we have, and Rob, maybe you can answer this, an increase anticipated this year from last year to, um, to the enrollment that we're actually budgeting for. Yes, and I'm doing this partially from my memory, but I think this number is correct, that this budget is based on 4,525 students, K-12, and I am, I hate to predict exactly because I may, then I won't be right. But I believe next year we will cross over the 4,600 student barrier um, at some point next year and I'm expecting we'll start the year with about 4,600 students. So there's a little cushion built here uh, just to be on the conservative side. Does this budget have any um, change in the class sizes that we've had this year? Does it keep them, we believe, pretty much the same as we've had this year going into next year? Actually, the elementary class sizes uh, proposed look really, really good. We're going to have a little bit of an issue at Aquila again, mostly because of space. And um, right now, projected, there would be no class sizes above 30 in the elementary system. There would be a large second grade at Aquila at about 28, 
and there would be a large fourth grade at Susan Lingernet, about 28, 29, but no classes over 30. We're trying to manage that by using open enrollment. So in some cases, we have open enrollment open, and in some case, cases, we have open enrollment closed. And um, the other really key number is kindergarten. Our kindergarten numbers are a little down right now, but we know there are students out there who have not registered yet. And so that is a little bit of a wild card. Um, how many, right now we have four kindergartens set up at all four elementary schools, so 16 kindergarten teachers, all full time now, all, all day kindergarten. We may need to add more if students come in that are not accounted for yet. It's a high quality kindergarten class. <laughs> I, can, I can attest to that. Uh, just a positive observation, I guess, that uh, I think this is the first budget in the last three years where we're actually uh, we're, uh, have more income than expenditures. I think the last couple of years we had a little deficit spending yes. and then our yes. fund balance goes up a little bit, although this is showing quite a bit. Yeah, um, we had some uh, revenue resources that came in that we weren't quite anticipating. Yeah. So that's good. It allows us some flexibility mm -hmm. and things to do, so that's positive. And Sandy, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but the, the fiscal year 14 budget that's coming to an end here in a few weeks that will be audited next fall, mm -hmm. there are some variables, some on the good side and some on the, the not good side. But one of them on the good side is that our enrollment was pretty stable this year. And we didn't mm -hmm. lose as many students through the year as we normally do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I've been noticing over the last several years, that our population has become more stable, and that will help us. There are always unanticipated expenses that come along that will probably offset that. But you know, we'll see when the audit is done how close we are to that projection. And hopefully there will be unanticipated revenues, too, that come in to offset it. One of the things that we do when, when we go through the budgeting process and Joe and I serve on the fact uh, and and part of what what we want to make sure that we do is that we approach this conservatively so sometimes uh, the fact that we can't remember exactly what we we talk about those numbers a lot and so we we've thrown around but as Rob says we've stabilized we we have consistent growth over these last almost 10 years now we, we've been coming up so it's it but we talk about those numbers, but we, as we project out into the future, we try to make sure that they're done rather conservatively so that we don't get unexpected expenditures and we do get revenue uh, generally modest, but, but in fact, uh, we came out this year a little bit better than we had anticipated. Conservatively reasonable is what I'm going to say. And Sandy, while you're up there, I'm going to put in a plug for the Financial Advisory Committee. We're looking for parents who would like to serve on that committee. We have had a couple of very dedicated people, but we're trying to get the word out. So next fall, we can have a handful of very dedicated parents to be on that committee. So if there are people out there that are interested, please contact Sandy. Thank you. And I believe it's on the website now, so we can, uh, it will be soon, OK, on the website. So you can um, look on the website for that information. And just to clarify, you said parents, but this could be any community member, right? Yeah, we usually try to get um, somebody that has um, a child that we're trying to get from each um, a different um, school, but certainly if somebody has had a child in, in their schools, they can certainly apply also. All right, thank you very much, Sandy. Next on is the Health and Safety Annual Report to MDE. This is something that used to be called the Attachment 99, and they changed it slightly, um, a little bit more easier, I guess, to identify some of the um, health and safety projects um, that we will be doing, not only for what's been approved. Basically, how this process works is we actually have to have our projects approved by the Minnesota Department of Education through what they call the Health and Safety um, Report. And um, th therefore, then we get our budgets um, 
from that report. And this is what this is showing is the health and safety report that we get off of the um, MDE website. And um, 2014 approvals um, are um, 489,358. Um, and we will know how that, um, how the um, actual expenditures go at the end of this audit year. Um, the 2015 approved um, items are 335,450, and the 2016 um, approved items are 320,800. And as we're still um, talking about the health and safety, there are items that still are working on getting approval from the state. But you know, if there is an approval process, we would be bringing budget amendments to the board um, come come the time when we bring the budget amendments. Um, so um, at this point, this is what we know at this point in time, and this is the uh, amount of budgets for fiscal year 2015 of 335,450 that we do have reflected in our budgets. Um, and the board does have the detailed um, uh, pro projects that were approved for each year, and um, if there's any questions, I can certainly answer any questions you may have. Let me ask a quick question. Uh, I'm a little confused on this handout of which numbers match which description. I think the dollar number is above the description looking at the beginning and the end. So it's the 25 to the playground resurfacing. Yeah, the number on the top, um, it'll have the um, date and a three-digit number, and then it'll say what school it is, and that's the dollar amount. And then the description is the next line down. That's correct. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sandy. Good work. Thank you. Um, next up is policy development. And let's take them one at a time. The first policy we'll talk about is policy 419. That's the tobacco-free environment policy. Um, that's the one um, that we began to look at last week, and it had a lot of suggestions in red from MSBA. Uh, some recommended, some part of their policy. Um, as we were adding e-cigarettes as, as, as our goal, but then there's more here than, than that. So um, any comments, discussion? So on point D about the school district will not solicit or accept any contributions or gifts of money, et cetera, um, we go after a lot of grant money from a lot of different entities. And as we um, look at that particular question, a company like Cargill, which is global and has many, many business interests and subsidiaries, are we going to get caught in looking for financial detail from companies that give us grant money in order to be in compliance with that particular statement? You know, Karen, that's a concern that I have. I, I, I have some reservations about, in fact, I'm in favor of taking D out, frankly, from this policy. That would be my suggestion, but I'm, let's see, hear what other people think, because I, I would not want to get mandated into that, I'd rather be able to consider any gifts to us individually than have to look at a blanket policy that is pretty broad. Okay. Yeah, it, it strikes me that that's probably the wise thing to do. I, I am not in favor of taking contributions from um, the major companies that are tobacco companies, but I can imagine I don't know if it would be reality, reality. Maybe there will be anti-smoking grants from those kind of I mean, there might be times where we want to accept that money. And so I think that is, uh, I would be comfortable with taking it out. Um, and um, making deliberate decisions on potential grants and, and gifts uh, as they, they come along. Um, 
I, I would want us to be cautious. I, I, I have a relative who started smoking um, uh, high school age because he says nobody ever said it was an unhealthy or bad thing. And he's um, younger than I am, and I think that was common knowledge. I don't want us to be ever accepting money that starts suggesting to our students that smoking is a healthy activity. Um, that was my perspective last week, um, just when I, or last time when I was more in favor of that provision. But I think we can make that decision on a case by case basis. Odds are which it'll never come up. But um, I, I'm satisfied if we took D out, which, just so the audience knows, is just an optional provision uh, suggested by the MSBA as possible inclusion. The only other comment I'd, I'd make is there may be a couple of typos here, so when we get to the action piece, it'll be subject to correcting those. There are a couple of other alternatives in how to approach this one. And rather than take it out, uh, we might simply adopt the statement that says the school district will not promote or allow promotion of tobacco products or e-cigarettes on school property or at school-sponsored events. Uh, and there are some really good, I mean, if you try to invest in a portfolio today that doesn't include tobacco or certain other aspect, alcohol, uh, it, it's awfully difficult to do and again Cargill's a big company they are a friend to the school district and I don't want to alienate those people either so uh, and again having audited Cargill I don't recall that they have any tobacco but I can't say that for sure but at the same time I don't want to alienate anyone with a very small percentage of their business related to it we might just adopt that sentence Imagine that we are in any way going to promote tobacco products or e cigarettes um, within the school, so I think we would be safe to add, keep. I would be comfortable keeping that sentence. I would too. I, yeah, I was just going to say, just to, to get the question out there, I would move that we adopt. Well, we're not on the action part of the agenda, agenda though, so it's too early. That That's no, it was just to yeah, but I, I like this suggestion, though. That's what I'll say. I like that. Dropping the first sentence of D, but keeping the second sentence. Anybody else want to discuss this before we move on to the next policy? Any other comments? Okay, then moving on to the next policy, which is policy 807. It is the health and safety policy. Um, it is a policy that was adapted in June 25, 2012. It was revised in September 24, 2012. It is up for readoption. There are no um, changes that are being suggested here, so it is not a new policy, nor is it a modified policy. So I, I, I think uh, it doesn't technically fall within our first and second reading uh, requirements, and uh, we can, we'll have it on the action agenda as we get down the line. But anybody have any comments on it? Okay. Then we will move forward to the uh, consent agenda. Now, there was a new consent agenda in front of the board at your seats when we arrived. It only has three items on it. I want to make sure everybody has the right consent agenda when we take the motion on it. Is everybody good with that? So to clarify, the new one that we have with the three rows is final and we're getting rid of the other two rows that are in our initial one? Uh, or it's just uh, Nancy, if I may, I'm looking yep. at Cindy and I'm going to say what I believe is the case here. I think we just got one page of a revised consent agenda. So if you look on the one that came in your board packet, there were appointments and you saw three names. And then there was a resignation, Julie Wavernick, high school math teacher. That is the, Julie is the name that we're correcting. We're taking her off. We are not going to process her resignation tonight. I think 
the second page, and Cindy, I'm looking for your help on this one, that does include a resignation still is in play here. I think we just got one page of a corrected. So the only correction is removing Julie Wawernick's name. She's going to end up applying for a leave of absence that we'll consider between now and the next board meeting. So now that we all know uh, for sure what's on the consent agenda, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved by Joe, seconded by Julie. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7 0. Now we're up to the action items. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2014 Health and Safety Annual Report as presented. Do I have a motion? Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved by Karen, seconded by Joe. Any discussion? Seconded by Ken, sorry. Any discussion? Uh, do we want to hear that it's within the parameters? Um, I guess that's my question, of whether this is within the Health and Safety Annual Report. Oh. Sorry. I'm one contract ahead. You're wanting, it's only 9.30, Julie. <laughs> so any discussion on the health and safety annual report? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7-0. Now we're there, Julie. Contract approval of the PC LAN Employee Group Employment Contract 2013-2014 and 2014-2015. It is recommended that the school board approve it as presented. So who will present, Sandy? Yes, this was another su successful uh, contract negotiations um, with the PC Land Group. Um, a lot of great con conversations and very positive um, negotiations process. Um, we did um, negotiate the contract. Um, there was no language items or very few language items, maybe some cleanup language items, but mostly it was monetary, and it did go within our parameters that were set before us. Is there a motion to approve the contract as presented? Is there a second? So it's been moved by Bruce, seconded by Jim. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7 0. So, next up is the policy, and I'm going to break this into two parts. Um, uh, Julie, would you like to make a motion with respect to the tobacco free environment policy? Well, I would like to uh, make a motion to incorporate, I think, Bruce's wise suggestion that. Um, we adopt the modifications to policy 419 with the exception of the first sentence in paragraph Roman numeral 2D. So do, uh, paragraph D would only read, the school district will not promote or allow promotion of tobacco products or e-cigarettes on school property or at school sponsored events. Moved by Julie, seconded by Bruce. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? It carries 7 0. Cindy, if you want to just a couple typos. Okay. Next is a, um, uh, is there a motion to approve policy 807 health and safety? There is, is there a second? second? So it's been moved by Jim and seconded by Karen. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7 0. Next, we have approval of the Employment Contract Director of Technical Assistance I 3 Validation Grant 2014 2018. It is recommended that the school board approve the employment contract between Independent School District number 283 as and Justin Barbo as Director of Technical Assistance, I-3 Validation Grant 
18 as presented. Before I ask for the motion, who will make the presentation? Um, this is um, an opportunity since we be became a sub-recipient of another I-3 grant to employ um, two individuals um, to reap some benefits from having them employed by us. Um, this um, contract um, was looked at by our attorney and uh, written by our attorney to reflect um, the needed um, requirements um, by the grant. And this, um, the first one is for the Director of Technical Assistance um, for the I-3 Validation Grant. And just to confirm, the, the funds, the grant funds, they go through uh, FY 2018? That's correct. And if I could add, uh, Jim, next meeting, June 23rd meeting, there'll be a contract in front of the board that will formally uh, adopt a process to bring funds from the grant to the district to pay the costs of these two contracts that you see here. So these two individuals in item D and item E, the first is Justin Barbeau, the second is Angie Jarebeck. They've been longtime St. Louis Park employees. They are now going to be working uh, basically full time for the grant. Keeping them as our employees is a benefit to us because as they go out and about in the school world, uh, they can carry the name St. Louis Park with them. In a sense, these contracts were created so that they could remain our employees. And then on June 23rd meeting, we'll have a contract in front of you from Spurwink, who's the funder of the I-3 grant, that will basically reimburse the district for the costs of these two positions. Will they be officed in our building and still be working in the building, or but they're out traveling? or? They will be. They'll both have an office in the school district. But they'll be spending a lot of time on the road. They'll be um, the the purpose of the latest I three grant is to expand the the ninth grade bar program that's at our high school to approximately fifty more schools across the country. So Justin and Angie will be on the road a lot, and as they go on the road a lot, they're going to come in contact with lots of funders. They told me today they already have a meeting set at Stanford, believe it or not, who is interested in this. Uh, learning more about what's happening here. So they uh, rub shoulders with people who have connections in the school world and uh, having them carry the name St. Louis Park as they go, I think will bring benefits to us. Is there any record keeping we're gonna need to, to make sure that they do in terms of tracking uh, time and things and that, that those systems will be put in place? Mm -hmm. And it, it, whose direction then are they responsible to then? The grant? I mean, your, yours ultimately, or, or I mean, the grant? That's a good question. They're they're going to be St. Louis Park employees because these are St. Louis Park contracts. But I understand the scope of their work, and they're going to be attending meetings here. They're going to be housed here. They're going to be here to give us advice and suggestions. So, the broader question of of uh, Direction. I'm assuming because they're going to continue to be our employees, they'll be under our direction. But they have a, a large task that's spelled out in the grant, too, of the work that they have to complete. And the only comment I would make is Angie has done a wonderful job getting us grants, is incredibly connected in that way and going to be more so, mm -hmm. and has developed a great deal of the skill and language that has been useful and hopefully as our employee we can begin to work on any successorship or added people to use what she knows and do that kind of grant work if she's busy doing this kind of work. Yes, her position is should be posted any day now. We'll be trying to find a new Angie <laughs> to take over her role. I, I, just what's running through my head is do we want to make this condition done on getting the Spurwink money um, for this. However, we haven't non-renewed either of them, so they remain our employees, and we have to pay them a salary, whether or not we approve this. But that's, in, to, to actually have them carry out these contracts, we obviously need the Spurwink um, money. So um, 
so that's my question to my colleagues here. Do we want to make our approval conditioned on uh, getting the contract from Spurwink in two weeks and approving that? I mean, yeah, is there any timing issue from them? I mean, and how certain is the money? I mean, I guess it can't hurt from our perspective unless there's a timing. I know there was a timing issue in getting these approved today. Um, I haven't thought through the conditional part of it, but I know that it's important to get them approved. I spoke to the director of Spurwink this afternoon, and she is well underway getting that contract to us. She's working with Michelle Kenny, who's our attorney, but um, not ready for tonight, but it'll be ready for two weeks. So I guess I'm not sure how to answer that question about a contingency. When they had the update meeting this spring that I got to attend, I mean, it was very, very evident that spreading the success of the bar program is it's we have done innovation very very well and other people want to replicate it and so the support in all these different entities across the country to master how do we do what we do um, it's kind of like an evangelization or evangelization process if you will that Angie and Justin can do but what helps them is staying based with us it's the living laboratory of where it originated. Does that help? And I have, well, I, I think my question, I know Spurwink has the money. I've read the grant. There's plenty of money there. Um, and I'm all for Angie and, and Justin having this opportunity, and all of that's fine. I just want to make sure we get the agreement signed, not someday. But the agreement signed that said Spurwink's going to give us the money. That's yeah, my the, only yeah, concern. I mean, the, qu the question is, what risk is there that we're not going to get if it's still negotiating? I mean, what, I mean that's the qu that we don't understand, I guess, right now is what's the risk that we wouldn't get money to fund these contracts? I think it's pretty low risk, but I also understand the board's concern, and and I'm thinking through as I'm sitting here, what would be the downside of making it contingent on having that money come through. And I don't, I don't think there is a downside. Is oh, Cindy is waving. I believe that these positions are to be effective July 1. So if the board chose to hold off on these contracts and have the Spurwing contract all come at the same time, um, I know that um, these contracts almost had a little flaw that they didn't come to you tonight, and we I talked to Angie, and they, she thought we had enough time to still approve them. So if the board's considering um, more information or more comfort zone or whatever, from my conversation with Angie today, I, I don't know that it would be a hardship to wait. I don't have 100% on that, but I, don't, I do know that their new jobs don't start until July 1. Thanks, Cindy. Well, the, so then my recommendation would be let's, let's hold on. There's no, if there's not, and if we find out different tomorrow, then we might need a special board meeting. But I think that's just prudent. Is let's make sure we got the money before we agree to the contract. So, is there a motion to table this? Well, before we do that, I, I just heard some sense of urgency to get this mm -hmm. approved tonight, uh, and they're on our payroll anyway so i mean just moving ahead shows our good faith and then spurwink will do their good faith part and go ahead and fund it so i i don't know i, I mean i i just i mean it just seems like we're holding off for two weeks or so i'm hearing an option to table it an option to do it as presented and so a third option which was julie's got us going and this is to approve it subject to getting the funding yeah. I kind of favor the third option myself. We can approve it, subject to getting the funding. And then if it doesn't come through, we, we're not on the hook. And if it does come through, look, which we think it will, we're good. And we don't have to revisit it in two weeks. And Nancy, I could add one more detail. I don't think it will matter. But I talked to when I talked to the executive director at Spurwing today, she was literally running this contract around to get people to sign it before uh -huh. she sent it to us. Okay. 
and she was asking me, you know, how how far do I have to drive today to get this signed? And I said, you can you can get it to us on, you know, we have time. We can do it on the 23rd at our 23rd board meeting. So I mean, it's pretty agreed to, and and it's to the signing stage before they send it to us. But hearing what Cindy said, you know, approving it based on the fact that the money does come through, I don't so, doesn't sound like it would be a hardship. Can we, um, if we sign this and then we find out in a week they're not going to give us the money, I think that's minimal risk. Um, I'm not raising this out of any real fear that anything's not going to come through. I just am troubled by signing four-year contracts for people to do work that's not for our district unless we know we've got the money. Sure. Yep. The work may benefit our district, but it's not in our schools for our, our, our students. Um, so, I'm, yeah, so I feel like just saying that it's conditioned on getting the contract with Spurring for the money is a wise step. I don't know, if, if we approved it tonight, um, well, we'd have a hard time rescinding it, but that's also possibly we could just approve it if we knew we could rescind it. I would prefer to just say that we're approving this conditioned on um, getting the contract from Spurwink, and I don't think we need to rewrite the, the contract because we're not changing the contract. Right. We're right. just conditioning our yeah. approval yep. on getting no, the Spurwink. Right. Yeah. I will move that we um, <laughs> approve uh, the first the contract before us now, the Director of Technical Assistance. Uh, employment contract uh, between ISD 283 and Justin Barbeau um, as presented s conditioned on um, obtaining and approving a contract from Spurwink, the fiscal agent for the I-3 grant prior, prior to July 1st. Second. It's been moved by Julie, seconded by Bruce. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7 0. And next up, it's recommended that the school board approve the employment contract between Independent School District number 283 and Angela Jerevic, Director of I 3 Validation Grant 2014 2018, as presented. And I would move um, the employment contract with the language that um, Nancy uh, just read with the additional language. I don't know if I can repeat what I said before, but conditioned on um, obtaining and approving uh, a contract from Spurwink, um, the fiscal agent for the I-3 grant prior to July 1st, 2014. Moved by Julie, seconded by Bruce. Bruce. Okay. Any discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 7 0. We have approval of the construction bid award recommendation. It is recommended that the school board approve the administration's recommendation of the construction bid award to Roken Corporation as presented. Roshan, that's how you pronounce it, Roshan. We should learn their name, Roshan Corporation, as presented. Uh, any, is there a motion? Moved by Karen, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ken, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7-0. Last on our action agenda is approval of City of St. Louis Park Telecommunications Committee reappointment um, last time we approved a um, appointment by Julie Schweitzer who graciously declined when we realized that um, uh, Rolf Peterson had not in fact resigned but thought he was still serving and would love to be reappointed and since Rolf has done a great job for us, Julia said, it's all yours Rolf. <laughs> we are Russell. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so it is recommended that the school board approve the gracious declination of Julie Schweitzer and reappointment of Rolf Peterson to serve on the City of St. Louis Park Telecommunications Committee for a term that expires December 2014. So moved. moved by Jim. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ken. Any discussion? I just want to thank Julie for her her service on the television. <laughs> I did make one email to find out some more information about it. Too, so. I think Rolf watches our meetings on cable TV. I, I, I'm not sure how he found out, but it wasn't from my email. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries. 7-0. We're up to communications and transmittals. I always look at Karen because I know she's always got one. I want to say um, thank you to the community who helped support a really successful senior all night party last Thursday. We had about 220 of 329 kids registered for the event. We had 142 senior and junior parents volunteering and we had a tremendous number of sponsors and donors that I'd like to quickly recognize. The SLP Rotary, the SLP Hockey Association, Applebee's, Caribou, Chipotle, DQ, Doubletree, Filio, JJ's Clubhouse, Knollwood Liquors, they did not provide alcohol, Leanne Shin, Liquor Boy, they did not provide alcohol, McCoy's, Rudolph's Barbecue, Starbucks, Supermoon Buffet, Tando, and Walk in the Park. And it was a great event. The kids had a really wonderful time. Assets. So Children First Assets. We had a fabulous celebration featuring Asset 16 High Expectations with our Senior Awards Night. And um, it's incredible. The, we had 69 scholarships donated under the organization of the Dollars for Scholars program. We had 90 students recognized for high academic and highest academic honors. We had 71 students recognized for presidential academic excellence in education. We had numerous individual um, honors. Um, it's, it's incredible. Uh, 104 kids received scholarships this year and um, a, just a tremendous number of people in our community who contribute to the Dollars for Scholars Fund and I'm, I'm very grateful to our community for doing this support because it shows when you do have high expectations for academic achievement the kids will do it. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to second what Rob said earlier about uh, the ACT Award. It, it was absolutely fabulous for us to win that national award. I mean, it, that, that is just powerful stuff. Uh, I had the honor of, of presenting for Rob at the Twin West, uh, the St. Louis Park Twin West uh, business meeting. and. Uh, Twin West and the entire chamber has supported the world's best workforce, which is which has been a, a, a reasonably good piece of legislation. And the ninth grade program, the college level classes, the increasing of our uh, black and brown students taking 160 students taking over 350 classes with a 95 percent pass rate. I mean that is just incredible. And then. The college possible kids. This is this is really fabulous stuff, and it's just wonderful for all of the people who contribute to this, to our IB and our AP programs, uh, for our immersion program. This is really good stuff, and I, I I think one of the requests that was made to me at the meeting was that we make sure we get this entire list out. Uh, I presented much as Rob did because he provided me with the speaking points, but uh, I, we need to get this out. We need to get all of this on our website in a format that markets this brand, that puts the pizza out there just as he's presented it because it's an excellent, excellent brand and people recognize that. 
It is. It was a. It was a thrill to be there to win it. It's a thrill to be back to talk about it. And it's only part of our story. I mean, there's even more going on that is outstanding uh, throughout the district. So it's just. It's a big part and it's an important part. But it's. It's still only part. And that's what makes it even more exciting to to be a part of this district. Um, go ahead, Joe. I know that was national, but going back to the state level, I just want to say very briefly. Congratulations to our boys lacrosse team mm -hmm. on their state championship. We don't get to say that very often, so great, great job by that team. I went to the game. I've never seen a lacrosse game. It's exciting. It's, <laughs> it's fun. And I attended the um, high school choir pops concert and senior recital at the end of May, which they do with the, our choirs do. Um, and it's just, it's always a very moving, wonderful end of year experience where the choirs sing great, but then the seniors who choose to get to pick their piece, take the stage, sing their hearts out, and their personalities show. They just shine. They lay it all out there on, on and there's some amazing talent and great courage. And it was just a thrill uh, to be there with the, with the seniors and their parents in the community to watch that. Our uh, commencement is tomorrow. Tomorrow is June 10th. If you're watching this delayed, you can probably see the commencement coming up next. But uh, <laughs> it's an exciting time, and we really all look forward to it. We're hoping for good weather, and we know we're going to have great, great graduates and wonderful families in a supportive community. So it's, it's going to be one of our high points. So is there a motion to adjourn? Second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>